Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses as we continue with part 16, The Question of Masonic Oaths, from Book the First, The Theory, from the Mystic Tide, by Albert G. Mackey. Part 16, The Question of Masonic Oaths, in the year 1738, Clement XII, at that time, Pope of Rome issued a bull of excommunication against the Freemasons and assigned as the reason of his condemnation that the institution confederated persons of all religions and sects in a mysterious bond of union and compelled them to secrecy by an oath taken on the Bible accompanied by certain ceremonies and the imprecation of heavy punishments. In a subsequent edict, His Holiness, exercising his dispositioning power, declared that oaths of secrecy and matters already condemned are thereby rendered void and lose their obligation. This persecution of the Freemasons, on account of their having an obligatory promise of secrecy among their ceremonies, has not been confined to the Papal See. We shall find it existing in a sect, which we should suppose, of all others, the least likely to follow in the footsteps of a Roman pontiff. In 1757, the Associate Synod of Seceders of Scotland adopted an act concerning what they called the Mason Oath, in which it is declared that all persons who shall refuse to make such revelations as the Kirk Sessions may require, and to promise to abstain from all future connection with the Order, shall be reputed under scandal and incapable of admission to sealing ordinances, or, as Pope Clement expressed it, be ipso facto excommunicated. In the preamble to the Act, the Synod assigned the reasons for their objections to the oath and for their ecclesiastical censure of all who contract it. These reasons are that there were very strong perceptions that, among Masons, an oath of secrecy is administered to entrance into their society, even under a capital penalty, and before any of those things which they swear to keep secret, be revealed to them and that they pretend to take some of these secrets from the Bible, besides other things which are ground of scruple in the manner of swearing the said oath. Authors note, this act of the Associated Synod was ably answered by a writer in the Scouts magazine for October 1757. I shall have occasion to quote some of his arguments in the course of this examination. These have, from that day to this, constituted the sum and substance of the objects of anti-Masons to the obligation of Masonic secrecy, and for the purpose of brief examination, they may be classed under the following heads. First, it is an oath. Secondly, it is administered before the secrets are communicated. Thirdly, it is accompanied by certain superstitious ceremonies. Fourthly, it is attended by a penalty. Fifthly, it is considered by Masons as paramount to the obligations of the law of the land. In replying to these statements, it is evident that the conscientious Freemason labors under great disadvantage he is at every step restrained by his honor from either the denial or admission of his adversaries in relation to the mysteries of the craft. He cannot, therefore, exhibit those mysteries to view or subject them to examination. He must, then, like the lion in the fable, suppose the picture such as it is represented by his antagonist. But we will grant, for the sake of argument, that every one of the first four charges is true, and then inquire in what respect they are offensive or immoral. First, the oath or promise cannot, in itself, be sinful unless there is something immoral in the obligation it imposes. Simply to promise secrecy, 
or the performance of any good act, and to strengthen this promise by the solemnity of an oath, is not, in itself, forbidden by any divine or human law. Indeed, the infirmity of human nature demands, in many instances, the sacred sanction of such an attestation, and it is continually exacted in the transactions of man with man, without any notion of sinfulness, where the time and place and circumstances are unconnected with levity or profanity or crime, the administration of an obligation, bonding to secrecy, or obedience or veracity, or the performance of any other virtue, and the invocation of deity to witness, and to strengthen that obligation or to punish its violation, is incapable by any perversion of scripture of being considered a criminal act. The command of our Savior to swear not at all has been interpreted by but a small part of Christendom as forbidding the administration of even judicial oaths. The theologians and commentators, with few exceptions, have given it a different meaning. Authors note. The ancients made a classification of two kinds of oaths, which the Greeks distinguished as the oath used only on solemn and important occasions and that used in trifling matters or even merely as an expletive to fill up a sentence. It is to the latter and not to the former of these modes of swearing that Christ refers in his prohibition. Whitby says, Christ by this prohibition must not be supposed to forbid all swearing as a thing absolutely evil. For in those writings which were indicted by the Holy Ghost, St. Paul doeth often seal the truth of what he delivered by an oath, and he adds, These words must not be so interpreted as to forbid all promissory oaths in which we do engage, by calling God to witness, we will be faithful to our promises, or will do this or that hereafter. Dr. Gill concurs in this opinion, and contends that the prohibitory words of Christ must not be understood in the strictest sense, as though it was not lawful to take an oath upon any occasion, in an affair of moment, in a solemn, serious manner, and in the name of God, which may be safely done, but of rash swearing about trivial matters and by the creatures. Even the Quaker, when he makes his solemn affirmation, is proclaiming an oath as sacred, though under a different form, as he who kisses the Bible. The essence of an oath is not the peculiar ceremony which accompanies it, but the implied attestation of God to the truth of the thing declared, or to the sincerity of the person making it. Secondly, the objection that the oath is administered before the secrets are made known is sufficiently absurd to excuse a smile. The purposes of such an oath would be completely frustrated by revealing the thing to be concealed before the promise of concealment was made. In that case, it would be optional with the candidate to give the obligation or to withhold it as best suited his inclination. If it be conceded that the exaction of a solemn promise of secrecy is not, in itself, improper, then certainly the time of exacting it is before and not after the revelation. Dr. Harris has met this objection in the following language. Would the ignorant call the oath is simply an obligation, covenant, and promise executed previously to the divulging of the specialties of the order and our means of recognizing each other, that they shall be kept secret from the knowledge of the world, lest their original intent should be thawed, and their benevolent poor per prevented. Now pray, what harm is there in this? Do you not all, when you have anything of a private nature, which you are willing to confide in a particular friend, before you tell him what it is, demand a solemn promise of secrecy? And is there not the utmost propriety in knowing whether your friend is determined to conceal your secret before you presume to reveal it? 
Your answer refutes your cavil. Thirdly, the objection that the oath is accompanied by certain superstitious ceremonies does not seem to be entitled to too much weight. Oaths, in all countries and at all times, have been accompanied by peculiar rites intended to increase the solemnity and reverence of the act. The ancient Hebrews, when they took an oath, placed the hand beneath the thigh of the person to whom they swore. Sometimes the ancients took hold of the horns of the altar and touched the sacrificial fire, as in the league between Latinus and Aeneas, where the ceremony is thus described by Virgil. Authors note, I touch the sacred altars, touch the flames, and all those powers attested and their names. Dryden Sometimes they extended the right hand to heaven and swore by earth, sea, and stars. Sometimes, as among the Romans in private contracts, the person laid his hand upon the hand of the party to whom he swore. In all solemn covenants, the oath was accompanied by a sacrifice, and some of their hair being cut from the victim's head, a part of it given to all present, that each one might take a share in the oath and be subject to the imprecation. Other ceremonies were practiced at various times and in different countries for the purpose of throwing around the act of attestation an increased amount of awe and respect. The oath is equally obligatory without them, but they have their significance, and there can be no reason why the Freemasons should not be allowed to adopt the mode most pleasing to themselves of extracting their promises or confirming their covenants. The ceremonies attributed by the Synod of Scotland and the other adversaries of the institution to the Masons are, according to their own statement, perfectly innocent in themselves, and charity, as well as common sense, would suggest the possibility that, to those who unite in them, these ceremonies, if there are any such, may have some impressive and appropriate signification. It is the mark of the grossest ignorance and the consequence of a contracted intellect to condemn what is not understood simply because it is incomprehensible. Fourthly, it is objected that the oath is attained with a penalty of a serious or capital nature. If this be the case, it does not appear that the expression of a penalty of any nature whatsoever can affect the poor port or augment the solemnity of an oath, which is in fact the attestation of God to the truth of a declaration as a witness and avenger, and hence every oath includes in itself and, as its very essence, the covenant of God's wrath, the heaviest of all penalties, as the necessary consequence of its violation, the writer in reply to the Synod of Scotland, to whom I have already referred, quotes the opinion of an eminent jurist to the effect. It seems to be certain that every promissory oath, in whatever form it may be conceived, whether explicitly or implicitly, virtually contains both an attestation and an obsecration. For in an oath, the execration supposes an attestation as a precedent, and the attestation infers an execration as a necessary consequence. Hence, then, to the believer in the superintending providence, every oath is an affirmation, negation, or promise corroborated by the attestation of the divine being. This attestation includes an obsecration of divine punishment in case of a violation, and it is therefore a matter of no moment whether this obsecration or penalty be expressed in words or only implied. Its presence or absence does not in any degree alter the nature of the obligation. Authors note, Whatever may be the form of an oath, its signification is the same. God is called to witness or to notice what we swear, and it is invoking his vengeance or renouncing his favor. 
if what we say be false or if what we promise be not performed. Paley, Book 3, Chapter 16. If in any promise or vow made by Masons such a penalty is inserted, it may probably be supposed that it is used only with a metaphorical and parasitical signification and for the purpose of symbolic or historical allusion. Any other interpretation but this would be entirely at variance with the opinions of the most intelligent Masons who, it is to be presumed, best know the intent and meaning of their own ceremonies. Fifthly, the last and indeed the most important objection urged is that these oaths are constructed by Masons as being of higher obligation than the law of the land. It is vain that this charge has been repeatedly and indignantly denied. It is in vain that we point to the integrity of character of thousands of eminent men who have been members of the fraternity. It is in vain that we recapitulate the order-loving and law-fearing regulations of the institution. The charge is renewed with untrying pernacity and believed with a credulity that owes its birth to rancorous prejudice alone. Let us, then, seek for its refusion in the language of our adversaries themselves. W. L. Stone was at one time a Mason of some eminence in the state of New York, but in the anti-Masonic excitement, he renounced his connection with the order and, as an evidence of the sincerity of his abjuration, wrote an octavo book of 560 pages for the avowed purpose of proving that the Masonic institution cannot and ought not longer to be sustained. This work was composed in the form of letters which were addressed to John Quincy Adams, the personal and political friend of Stone and one of the bitterest enemies of Freemasonry that those days of excitement and bitterness produced. In the seventh of those letters, Colonel Stone thus meets and refutes the accusation that Masons hold the obligations of the order as paramount to those of the law of the country in which they live. Is it then to be believed that men of acknowledged talents and worth in public stations and of virtuous and frequently religious habits in the walks of private life with the Holy Bible in their hands, which they are solemnly pledged to receive as the rule and guide of their faith and practice and under the grave and positive charge from the officer administering the obligation that it is to be taken in strict subordination to the civil laws, can understand that obligation, whatever may be the peculiarities of its phraseology, as requiring them to continence, vice, and criminality, even by silence? Can it for a moment be supposed that the hundreds of eminent men whose patriotism is unquestioned and the exercise of whose talents and virtues has shed a luster upon the church history of our country and who, by their walk and conversation, have, in their own lives, illustrated the beauty of holiness. Is it to be credited that the tens of thousands of persons raking among the most intelligent and virtuous citizens of the most moral and enlightened people on earth, is it, I ask, possible that any portion of this community can, on calm reflection, believe that such men have oaths upon their consciences, binding them to eternal silence in regard to the guilt of any man because he happens to be a Freemason, no matter what be the grade of offense, whether it be the picking of a pocket or the shedding of blood. It does really seem to be impossible that such an opinion could at any moment have prevailed to any considerable extent amongst reflecting and intelligent citizens. Yes, still I am aware that an awful example of that can be cited against me. Author's note, he here alludes to the well-known case of Morgan. I do not intend at this time to open that unhappy controversy, but it may be as well to remind the reader that the only witness who testified to the circumstances of the imprisonment and murder was one Edward Giddens, 
that much of his evidence was of a hearsay character, that he appeared in the questionable position of an accomplice, confessing his guilt to escape punishment, that his testimony is corroborated neither by circumstances nor by other witnesses, and that lastly, according to his own showing, he was an atheist. On the other, there are good reasons for believing that no violence was ever offered to the person of Morgan, but that he left this country for the purpose of his own pecuniary emolument, the chaplain of Frygate Brandywine, which carried Lafayette to France in the year 1825 and was afterwards stationed in the Mediterranean, states in an account of the cruise which he published that he saw and conversated with Morgan at Smyrna in Turkey. Again, when Ezra Sturgis Anderson stated in the Hollowell Advocate that he had seen Morgan, whom he knew years before, passing by the name of Harrington on Mount Desert Island on the coast of Maine in April 1829, hell and hardy and boasting that he made $20,000 by his book, I know not how much credibility is to be attached to either of these statements. I suppose that they are worth at least as much as those of Gideon's, and, at all events, they leave us to form our opinions on this subject altogether from possibilities. Certainly no argument on the subject of Masonic obligations is to be found on circumstances which we have no reason to believe ever occurred. See a very impartial narrative of the anti-Masonic excitement written by Henry Brown, counselor at law and published at Batavia, New York in 1829. And I am also aware that the authors of the example to which I refer have not been treated by the whole Masonic fraternity with that degree of indignation and abhorrence which they justly merited. On the contrary, it is but too true that in some instances, ignorance and fanaticism have conspired to extend aid and comfort to those who with good cause are believed to be of the guilty number. Still, however, I must protest against the construction attempted to be put upon the obligations as being directly at variance with the interpretation always given them by those with whom I have formerly mingled in intimate fellowship among Masons. These are, I believe, the only objections that have been urged to the Masonic oath, vow, or promise whichever of these it may be considered, and I trust that I have shown their insufficiency as to the assertion made by a few anti-Masonic writers that these obligations have no binding force as this question is entirely unconnected with the defense of the institution, and as any effort to prove the falsity of such a doctrine would, in my opinion, be an insult to the principles of honor and even of common honesty, which I presume to actuate my readers, I shall leave this topic entirely untouched. Thank you for watching, and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Roses. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.